So we see that people in this group are really uh, a mixture of, let's say, the more traditional people who, who like to get into this web development and then to go more and more to the JavaScript. Even the, the AngularJS, they, they come up with this TypeScript. I, I mean, they, they will um, push it so that the, the TypeScript will influence the web development for sure in the, in the near future. future. So um, these are topics which are all around of the AngularJS. Um, also the same with the Ionic framework, as you know, so it's based on, on Angular. And there will, will also be, a, and is already a big influence in the um, um, development of mobile applications as well as the native script. And let's see what will be the future with the Angular 2. So if this will be a framework for, a common framework for the ones who don't want to build or are skilled or whatever hacky enough to build their own frameworks, like the real JavaScript geeks, right? <laughs> or you, you probably like to choose the React.js. <laughs> I can do this joke. Um, yeah, we're doing uh, just regular meetups with talks and all the workshops or hackathons, so we want to focus more in the uh, yeah, upcoming meetups on uh, just um, workshops, uh, like we have some uh, invitations from NativeScript or offers that they will do a workshop for us. We will do an Angular 2 workshops where we talk already with uh, hosts. And the upcoming meetup is in the next in two weeks, I think, and we have a special guest like Martin Probst, who is uh, in the core team of Angular, so we will get the deep and dirty insights, and from Raul, who is a Google developer expert uh, from Barcelona, so if you want to join, just uh, yeah, join our meetup group in order to get updates. That's it so far from our group. Hi, I'm re representing uh, the Munich Node.js user group tonight, or for short, the MNUC. I see many familiar faces here, so maybe please raise your hand if you already joined the MNUC meetup. Yeah, yeah the dark side of JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> Founded late in 2011 on the JSConf EU, I had the idea and uh, asked uh, Bela for his permission uh, because I was in 2011, I was a regular member of the Munich JS uh, user group, uh, but seeking for server-side JavaScript, and this was more front-end stuff. So I asked Bela if uh, they maybe would allow another user group focusing on back-end stuff, and they were more than happy to give their permission. So until now, we already have 26 meetups, but we only we not only do meetups, but we also do workshops. So maybe some of you saw the latest uh, workshops we had in end of February. Christina, are you here? I see you there, raise your hand. She was organizing uh, the JS weekend workshop with four workshops on Saturday and Sunday for free. It was a great success, abs absolutely top workshops. Uh, and uh, so we also had a note beginner Week, uh, workshop on a sun Saturday with Golo Roden. Um, so we try to do uh, a bit more than just uh, regular meetups that are on a schedule, so any two months. So the next meetup will be in April, uh, late April this year. Um, this is our website, mnook.de. You find the sources also on GitHub. So if you want to give a talk, you just have to <laughs> raise a pull request. And uh, <laughs> Until now, we have 83 talks so far, and uh, uh, is this live? Is, is, is this the internet? <laughs> can, you, hey, can you click on video? Maybe if you click on video. Yes. Yes. So if you are not familiar with the website, um, I highly recommend that you take a look because we have 36 of our talks recorded on video, so you can, even if you were not there, you can still uh, entertain yourself with the videos. And uh, we already hit the, the 10K view uh, limit with uh, Golo Roden's talk about uh, how Node.js streams are working. So this is, I think this is a very great 
great success and uh, all our meetups are also organized on meetup.com. There's a group for the Munich Node.js user group. And a last word before I end this, actually if you look in the original program you saw that the talk was for tonight was planned to be given by Julian Grube, Gruber. Sadly he's ill at home so my best wishes be well soon Julian. And so we searched for a replacement. So Bodo joined in on a very short notice yesterday. Are you still? Are you already here, Bodo? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I wish us all a great evening. Have fun with the J Summit. Das Wort heißt nur mal laut genug, ist, sonst kommt es sonst bis beim Video komisch drinnen. Okay. Aber vielleicht eine Suche oder so. Uh, hello, my name is Bila Varga. I'm the founder of Munich.js and together with Axel, the organizer. Um, we had started five years ago uh, with a few people. It was more like a Stammtisch. Um, this is the first picture. <laughs> yeah, it's very historic. Um, And now, after five years, um, we had more than 30 events sponsored by big companies and small companies here in Munich. So we are traveling around from one location to the next one. And uh, we had uh, speakers uh, from local heroes from Munich to rock stars, a um, few of them. <laughs> um, we had also Skype direct connection to, um, to JSConf. And uh, we have uh, nearly 200 attendees and 1,500 in total. Um, and we had also fun. <laughs> But after five years, uh, we want to go the next step. And um, I'm very happy about that I can show you something new. I hope it works. Es ist äh, schön, dass so viele Leute zusammenkommen können, äh, dass man sich austauschen kann über die größten Technologien. Great talks, great inspirational talks and tech talks and the environment for networking. Yeah, it's great. Ich war jetzt hier zum ersten Mal allgemein auch, weil das mein erstes Meetup und meine erste Konferenz und es war einfach toll.
Thank you. Um, before I show you some details, I want to introduce the team behind uh, the JS Congress. Um, Julia Kurt. Johannes Weber. Marco Stippek. Marco Engelhardt. And Axel Rauschmeier. It's the team behind uh, the JS Congress. And we worked very hard on that, and we have a very nice, really nice prize only for you with uh, voucher code M MOOC, uh, MOOC uh, 16. And you can go to jscongress.de uh, and order your tickets. Um, <laughs> take a photo for later. And uh, we are also looking for, for sponsoring. And if you have any questions, uh, come to us later. Um, yes, thanks. A short story how this Congress will take place. Uh, we started, or I started, uh, coding JavaScript in 1995, and I had big problems not solvable at that time. Now we are flying node copters with uh, JavaScript. Now we are uh, creating IoT devices with JavaScript. Now the most successful platforms in the internet are uh, driven by JavaScript, and we are a great community now. And I think it's time to celebrate it, the great things we do every day. And the second thing is that we have to exchange in the community. So uh, that was mainly the reason we found together. And I hope you'll enjoy it in November. So get your ticket. OK. So now it is time for the first talk. This is the Munich JS talk by Katya. Okay, um, well, I'm very excited to welcome you guys here at Stylet, the place where I work every day. Yay! Um, so, I just want to tell you a bit about my background. Um, I was born and raised in Moscow, Russia, and at the age of six, I started doing synchronized swimming, and I continued doing that through my teenage years, at which point I joined the Russian junior national team. And we trained eight hours a day. It was quite intense. Um, and the team became very successful. We, were, we won European and world championships. So that was... Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And after success in sports, I decided to focus on my education. And I was lucky enough to be accepted to Stanford and to be able to pursue computer science at Stanford, one of the best computer science departments in the US and perhaps in the world. So very proud of my roots and alma mater. Uh, after I graduated, I started working at a small startup called Digital Chocolate. Um, the company was a video game developer for cell phones. And the founder was Trip Hawkins, the founder of EA, Electronic Arts. So it was also very interesting and exciting to work with him. It was a team of 20 people. I really like how small it was and how young they were. We were all dorks, and I, I really enjoyed working there. Uh, and that was the days before iPhone, so we really uh, perfected pixel art and you know <laughs> all the funny little levels. I mean, this is this is great. Um, and then after a while, I was approached by a colleague from Stanford, and he invited me to join another startup, which was called iMeme. I don't know, may maybe some of you heard of it. That was on the dawn of music sharing. And with iMeme, I went through the classical startup experience. I don't know if any of you have seen Silicon Valley on HBO. Um, it's a great show, check it out. Uh, but <laughs> there are a lot of cliches there, but they're actually true. And so we started with the office in downtown Palo Alto. We would go out, drink gourmet coffees. We will have like, I don't know, vegan food. And then, um, then came the growth where we moved to an office in San Francisco with a brick wall. And I mean, it's like, it's really good times, I have to say. And uh, you, 
Um, we were working mostly in XP programming. I don't know if you know about this Scrum, Agile. We will we'll talk more bit about it in a bit. Um, but then also, like 95% of all startups in Silicon Valley, we got into trouble. And our trouble was to get sued by Warner Music label. And eventually, we were bought by MySpace for some very little money. Um, after that, I took a break to become a full-time mom. Um, and I spent those two years in Turkey, which was quite also interesting after the US, after 13 years living in the US, I would say. That was quite interesting. And then uh, when I was ready, I joined a research lab, SAP in Moscow, where um, we worked on the Internet of Things technologies. And our job was to predict what do companies want, what's going to be breakthrough product, work on prototypes together with companies. And at SAP, while at SAP, I met my future husband. And after a few months, unfortunately, SAP Global Research was dissolved, at which point I decided to come to Germany. And my next company is, uh, was Citrix Online, based in Karlsruhe. And this is a SaaS division of Citrix, which focuses on online conferencing and uh, support, online support tools as well. Okay, so as you can see, I was, it's a pretty even split in my experience with a startups and enterprise. And so um, last, I mean this past summer, when we decided, my family decided to move to Munich, I was pretty um, clear that I want to go back to startup, back to smaller setups, that I didn't want to do corporate anymore. And I will talk a bit why that is. And uh, I was lucky, again, enough to join one of the great companies in Munich, which is Stylite. So now I'm a senior Java, not script, but I also do JavaScript as well, just so that <laughs> you don't think I'm a random person from the street. Um, OK, so when I think about why, why do I prefer small startups? Why do I prefer, in general, why do I enjoy software development? You know, I mean, yes, great to solve problems. Again, another cliche of startups to make our world better. Uh, <laughs> but there are other things, you know, and I think that the um, big reason for that is that it gives me a team feeling that I used to experience as part of the sports team. So just a quick show of hands. How, have you, how many of you feel comfortable working in a team? How many of you would rather prefer to work alone? It's really good. <laughs> yes, we have some lone wolves, but it's actually good. I was expecting more people being comfortable working alone. I did have experience uh, with people on the team that would say, I don't want to do any pair programming. I don't want to do all of this stuff. I, leave me alone. I want to go to my cave and just program. So um, when I think about characteristics of teams and I think about what makes a good sports team, what makes a good software development team, in particular, agile software development team, um, and I assume that pretty much everyone is familiar with, with the Agile software development methodology. Yeah? So in sports, what I learned is that no matter how good of individual athlete you are, no matter how good your performance is, um, in team sport, you only judged your success is only when the team succeeds. So you're, it's in your interest that all your teammates perform well, not just you, but then that Everyone is at the same level, or at least at the same level, and then you are judged, your performance is judged, is based on the team performance, not on your individual one. You, tra you train really hard to get to the team, to get on the best team, which I'm sure you all want to be part of the best teams here in Munich or internationally in the US, whatever. So that's why you perfect your skills, you get the best as you can be, but then when you get to the team, it's the team success. How the team performs. That's how you're being judged. Um, and in the software develop, in the agile software development, you achieve this by doing pair programming, by doing um, code reviews, by doing knowledge sharing sessions. This is something we also started practicing. No one is hogging the knowledge. There's no like this one Yoda who, you know, you have an issue and then you come to him and oh master, please help me how to do this. You try to disperse the knowledge in a team. Um, another characteristic of a great team is a purpose, common goals, and a purpose that is greater than yourself. So clearly, when I, when I was on the Russian national team, the purpose 
um, the common cause was pretty clear to make Russia win every single <laughs> top position in every discipline that's possible, to promote Russian sport, to become Olympic champions. Um, in agile and in a sprint, I guess, uh, cycle, your, I, I would say the cause is your mostly the monthly or the quarterly goals, which is really you have to work with your managers and with the product owners, and I would say it's really not an easy task to set the vision. And the better the vision is understood within the team, the better the team performs. Um, the goal is pretty clear. Again, in a sports team it was, okay, world championships are coming up, we must win. And then you always have a deadline. There's always next competition, and it, the, pretty, the goal is pretty clear, to win it. And as the time of the competition approaches, you become more focused. We were really getting into the fight mode. You're really quiet. You're really concentrated. With the sprint, I like it. Ver I like very much sprint as well because the goal is pretty clear. The expectations are again very clear. You don't have to second guess. There are specific goals that you have to achieve by the end of two weeks or whatever your sprint is. One week, three week, whatever. So I really like that clarity. I never have to. It's not wishy washy. It's not fuzzy. Okay, this is what we're committing, and this is what will be, will get done. And most of the time, you can also feel that if there's you're getting close to the end of the sprint, and nothing or something is hanging off the cliff, the team is kind of becoming more focused, and you get more resources and more support to get this done. Um, and like I said, with the vision and with the cause, it's really important to set these to be clear. What are, what is this common thing in the end that we are working towards to? Um, so the next aspect I think is very important is the social aspect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so the team that plays together well, that laughs together, that has good chemistry, tends to perform better. And in the sports, this is achieved by going to boot camps. And so as an athlete, you spend a lot of time on the road. I spent half of my year basically on the road, in hotels, in God knows where, and then half at home. Home was more like, I don't know, I, would, I, I wouldn't even unpack. I would come after boot camp, drop my bag by the bed, stay there for a week, and then leave again. And so you sp we used to spend a lot of time in hotels outside of the swimming pool. Hotels, airports, airplanes, and you get to know your teammates on an intimate level, very closely. And again, I used to really not take this seriously when in my professional career, I always thought those are tacky, you know, like, oh, let's do team building events. And again, in the corporate world, it's more like once a year, they will take the company out for some force, they will get a coach, and they'll say, okay, let's do team building once a year. That doesn't work like this. I think the more intimate, the more you have, I don't know, it has to be really spontaneous. Try not to, it shouldn't be driven by the management. Oh, guys, you have to to be closer, you have to build the team. But nowadays, I, I try to really set time for it. Like even if I, you know, I have a son at home, but I try to find a babysitter. And I think it's important, you know, whatever it is. Here we at Stylight, we watch movies together, we watch American football together, Oscar party together. Um, you go to team lunches. We had one today, which was awesome. Um, this is the team dinner, which happened, I don't remember when, but recently, actually. Um, so I think the social aspect should not be underestimated and I think that um, in the reason is because it leads to building trust and commitment to the team so this is what is called a lift in synchronized swimming and usually a lift is one or more people being propelled out of the water by the other team members on the team there are usually eight people that are simultaneously in the water and as you can see the point of contact here there are four girls right there are two on the Two on the hands, on the arms, two on the feet. And then there's this called this element of risk. So the timing has to be perfect. The girl is going to fly over the other girl. And I think it would really suck if she landed on her. So I, would, I think that would, that would be horrible, right? Or if like one of the girls was coming up late from the water, then the whole bridge will collapse. It will look ugly. So the, in, in the synchronized swimming, it's really important to trust. And you just have to know, you come to the water, to the surface, and without goggles, you don't really see a lot. You see just like these shapes, the blobs, and you kind of, the only have to do is just to trust that the other three will come up at the same time. 
that this will happen. And I mean, of course, you practice eight hours a day to make it happen, but during the competition, it's just trust that this will happen. Um, in, in the software development, the same thing. I feel that I trust my colleagues 100%. I know that they're delivering. They're not going to cheat. They're not going to be like lazy bombs. And when you do pick tasks from the sprint, from the backlog, you always know you don't have to have your hand in every single task. Things will get done because your colleagues are top-notch engineers and they will do their best to get things done. When we have our retros, it's, there's never a blame game saying, oh, we didn't deliver because Matt didn't do something, or because of her, because of him. We all know that we did our best. And um, lastly, this is um, what I call the team's awareness. So in synchronous swimming, besides being um, a lot of things you've been judged on, uh, being artistic and being technically propelling yourself very high out of the water, being synchronized, of course, uh, having elements of risks, risk. Um, another thing that's very important is alignment, and we swim in patterns. So basically, you're supposed to change the pattern around 20 times in three minutes. So basically, team will start like in a line, then they will spread out in a square, then there will be another change of pattern, and they're always changing every couple minutes, or not couple minutes, 15 seconds, you have to swim to a new spot. And I like this picture a lot because, as you can see, these guys, they look like they're in a... Uh, Okay, some kind of formation, but as you can see, the diagonal line looks pretty good. And so, a lot of times, when you're underwater and you're doing your figure, you turn your head. And even if you don't have goggles on, like I said, it's really just blobs. You have to be aligned. You have to say, okay, I see my colleague in front of me. You trust that the colleague behind you is aligning with you and the one in front. And then you're checking all of your directions, all of your lines. And I think in, again, in agile software de development, this is achieved through daily stand-ups where you're aligning, you're aware what your colleagues are working on. You're not like swimming in some isolation. You don't know what everyone working on. And then as you can see here at Stylite, we have very open, um, office, you know, there are no really walls, and some people have trouble with it, you know, because it's getting loud, but I actually prefer that because there are work discussions that take place that make you aware of what's going on around you. You're not in isolation. If you ask me what each of my colleagues is working on, I know where they are, and I think that as I compare my experience, the better the teams, the more you know what everyone is working on. If you're just like, I don't know, man, I'm just working on my, you know, library or whatever, that usually tends to hurt the performance. So to just uh, summarize, I want to say that great team players are not being born and you're not becoming one overnight. It's something that you develop years after years. I think that I started developing mine since I was six. And I think with the spread of the Agile and Scrum and, I don't know, ex, um, extreme programming um, methodologies, it's really important to f think about, to reflect, are you a good team player? What, uh, how do you contribute? Do people enjoy working with you? Because, for example, if we have two team members and one is like a super, super clever geek and the other one is a great team player, we will always choose team player over the clever person. So just some, something to reflect and think about. Thank you for your attention. All right. So the next talk is by Bodo. Hello, um, 
I will start uh, in about three minutes. So if you want to have something to drink, please rush to the freezer. So was wie ein Stock oder ein Laserpointer habe ich jetzt zufällig nicht, oder? Hm. Äh. Ah ja, also... Ist ansonsten auch nicht so wichtig. Also jetzt bist du gerade im Presenter. Du machst den Presenter View, oder? Ist mir eigentlich nicht so wichtig. Ach so, okay. Aber es kann, kannst du auch so lassen. Ist nicht so okay, ohne Presenter View müsst. Ja, okay, das weiß ich jetzt nicht, wie man es beim Powerpoint einstellt. Das weiß ich nur im Kino. Ist nicht schlimm, dann zeige ich einfach. Okay. So. Ja. All right, let's sit down. Let's get started again. Settle down, everybody. Hello, um, I'm going to talk about uh, image segmentation in JavaScript. And um, I think a good presentation always starts with a story. I mean, the former presentation also started with a story, so let's do this too. And um, I'm actually from Berlin and uh, just moved to Munich two years ago. And um, in Berlin, I actually, maybe I just missed the, um, the meetup groups, but I thought web development is developing CRUD applications. So um, as I went to Munich, I first saw things like computer vision or data science. And um, these things were very new for me. And I find, found them quite interesting. So uh, I was once at the uh, computer vision group. Um, and they had a very interesting talk. And it was about image segmentation in 20 questions. So the idea was um, from... Um, Wait a minute. Yes. Uh. <laughs> ah, no. Okay, um, so there was this um, doctorate at the um, Info um, Computer Science Institute in Garching from the TU Munich. And he had a quite interesting paper, which is called Image Segmentation in 20 Questions. And um, the basic idea is uh, you have an image, and you get um, different points 
which are randomly chosen, and you say you can press uh, yes or no if this point lies into a special segment you want to uh, classify. And um, the idea now was that can you completely classify this image in just 20 questions? And I found this so interesting because it was something uh, where you use mathematics. I actually always thought mathematics is uh, useless because normally when you develop, you use libraries, you don't need any quick sort, bubble sort, or whatever there is. And um, also, I didn't saw any use for Xenos, cosine, cosine, or whatever. And this was interesting because this uh, took um, at least the statistical part quite a lot of use of mathematics and was something new for me. So um, I asked him if I could uh, work on this project and the good thing about um, theorists is um, they can't do anything practically. So the thing is they have a, they're super good at writing these research papers which uh, extends your English vocabulary in new dimensions but uh, they don't know how to really implement this with modern technology. And um, this was the part where I saw myself. And um, so uh, I took some parts of the research paper and uh, implemented it. And now let me show um, a demo. Ah, oh, yes. Um, here we have uh, a picture, and we can see these blue dots. And if I now want to classify the, I don't know how you call the animal in English, but this uh, animal, um, we uh, just need to find the blue dots and always press uh, hmm? Punkster Tony will. <laughs> Ah, is this not an ad mention? Okay. However, uh, I found it was a nice uh, image, and um, what I'm now doing is, this may take a bit, um, because you always search for the blue points, is um, to classify this. In the final, the final idea was actually that this is done by a pen or maybe even um, with a speech interface. But now we just do it just a bit like a game. Okay, and um, now it's, uh, I pressed enter and it should uh, start the segmentation process, which indeed takes a while because uh, it's not very optimized and in reality you would uh, downsample the image much more further than I have done it. So, um, I hope it, yes, uh, fine. Okay, so you see now um, this part of the animal is positive, segmented, and everything around it is dark. So, and this was something new for me um, because as I told you, I was just, I just knew how to make CRUD applications and um, I had the benefit of someone who explains me everything so I don't have to understand everything which is here and here, but in the end you also don't need this really, uh, they are just some fancy notations. Um, yes, so uh, how is the, this project actually built up? You have actually uh, two parts. The one is the image segmentation, which I've done, and the actually second part, which I've not really started, is the Monte Carlo Markov chain simulation. Also a very fancy word. I think uh, if I make a startup, it's definitely, it would have this name. Um, and um, the idea is uh, the, the, the points are randomly chosen, but um, you have uh, specific properties of the image, so you could uh, choose the points still randomly, but more wiser. For example, um, if I know um, I have a, um, a green point maybe uh, here, uh, and I'm not sure if this, this is the same color, then uh, if I would have a red point here, it would help me uh, quite a lot to segment this picture. But uh, in the actual example, I've didn't done this, and I will only scratch the surface of this method. 
But uh, how does the image segmentation, so the uh, thing how to know what part of the image belongs to the, to the piece I want to segment and what not, how is this done in JavaScript or generally? So we all know um, an image is actually just something like a matrix, a table, um, where we have uh, each pixel and uh, a normal color image is also split up into red, green and blue. So if this is now our image, we for example would have here a, a value of 200 and this would be something very red or we would have a value of zero here, this would mean there is no red and if you then put these uh, information together you have the color image. So um, now we have uh, still this uh, image box but we have two points on it now which uh, have a defined coordinates. For example, the green ring is a positive one and the red ring is a negative one. And we know, for example, uh, maybe this, this part here belongs to, um, to an area I want uh, to segment. And uh, I've marked this here as um, a part which is in the segment and this is something which is not in the segment. We use something called geodesic distance transform, um, also a fancy sounding word, um, but it's also actually quite simple what it does. So what you do is um, you try to calculate the distance um, from the upper left corner to, the, to every element here, and it should be the shortest distance. So for example, from the upper left corner to the next one, we have um, a color difference of two, uh, a color difference from three to two is one as a color difference and also one because we move one to the left, uh, to the right. And this is also the idea behind um, you have the color difference and also always plus one for the area distance. And you do this for, um, for the positive ones and for the negative ones. And then we see, for example, that um, if we want to reach uh, from the negative one, the upper left um, part, we have a distance of four. And um, if we want to reach uh, this part here from the negative one, we have just a distance from one. And now we can compare both distances together and choose the closer one to be positive and the wider one to be the negative for both. So the result is a binary map where we then um, know what area in the image we can mark, positive and negative. This is also for the research guys interested. Uh, this is the research paper which explains this more complicated than I've done, but uh, it's actually more or less what I've told you, just in more words. Um, yes. So um, the next thing is um, how do you calculate the distances? So there the research paper takes an approach which is called forward and backward scan. So you have um, from maybe 1,000 times 1,000 um, as an image, you just take the first uh, three or nine elements of this image and then you always move one to the right. So I've tried to um, make a diagram here. So first we, we have just these three and we compare the distance from uh, this one to this one and this one to this one. And then we move one next. So we always have um, already calculated distance where we can compare to. Because it wouldn't make any sense to start, for example, in the middle of the image when there is no starting point. Um, and to try to calculate any distance when we don't know where to start from. And by um, just going row by row in a, a three times three kernel, so just a three times three cut out of bit, um, and then doing the, gain, the same uh, backwards again, we can um, uh, create a distance map which is quite accurate. And um, to show you how more or less um, easy this uh, look, I can uh, show you a code part. This is also on GitHub if you're interested. Um. Uh, 
Um, yes. So, yeah, we need to uh, know what size the image has, and more or less, it's just two, four, three, four loops which go um, together, and then um, also some fancy um, map reduce stuff here and filter. Or oh, here, this is fancy. Um, which then calculates the, it's, it's quite optimized, maybe it looks a bit uh, strange, but it doesn't do so much than just some for loops which do the calculations as I explained. Okay, and um, so this is how we actually know uh, how to uh, define this area here. And we see it's more or less accurate. Um, there are some errors inside here, for example, I personally don't know why we have a zebra, mu a zebra pattern here. Um, and it's also not quite logical why this part over here uh, is not uh, is segmented negative. But I don't know why this is uh, the case, um, but for the most part it works. Okay, now uh, let's get back to the Monte Carlo simulation. So what does this fancy term mean? Um, we have um, actually um, four parameters we can change. For example, we can change the image channel, if it's now red, green, or blue, uh, where we do this um, segmentation on. We can also change this moving parameter. This just means how sharp or unsharp we make the image. And we also can uh, randomly move or remove uh, these seeds. So these points are called seeds. And, um, the changing the image channel and the smoothing parameter are both um, uniformly distributed, so I just, um, there are uh, same chances for having the green or the blue or the red image channel. And um, changing the seeds is a bit more complicated because you create a histogram on the color values, but uh, yes, I skipped this part. And what we now do is um, we always change one of these parameters and we do this 1,000 times, and after these 1,000 times, um, this is there to create something very randomly, and then we uh, do this 250 times, but then we always check if the segmentation we created uh, is better with the change parameter than it was before. And to check this, we have a validation function which just tries to um, which uses uh, G squared. This is a, um, a mathematical approach where you just look, uh, for example, when you have, um, it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't make much sense if, for example, here, if you would have uh, a segmented image and uh, you would have a very strange pattern. And this is what you use as validation. And um, after these twi 250 uh, steps, where every step improves, uh, improves the other one, else it would uh, be reset, you have something which converges to a specific setting, and you use the setting to um, try to find um, the, the seed which you would like to know to have um, the best information win for you to segment this image. There's also um, a part in the paper where we can see this. So um, you see this beer, for example, and you have um, different um, segmentations run on it. And if you now overlap them together, you see that there is one part where you aren't very sure if this uh, really belongs to the beer or not. And then you can place this uh, dot into this part and uh, improve the time, uh, the questions it takes to find uh, the right segmentation. So. This is the theory, um, but uh, how does it look, um, how do I implement this? And um, the first thing is um, the, the actual algorithm which does most of the work. You can see here how you would use it without an image or with just some um, uh, empty image. And I've also written some uh, simple tests which just are very small images, um, and then they try to uh, 
compare how a distance map would look like if you would run this uh, distance transformation on these um, arrays. So um, this is how uh, the actual segmentation works, which is the most complicated part, but I also have the front end. And um, I used for the front end itself, I used DQJS. Um, who knows DQJS? Okay. Uh, I don't use, it's a bit like React, but better. I don't <laughs> use, <laughs> I don't use uh, React because it's too enterprise for me. And my definition for to enterprise is if the API doesn't change while I'm developing, it's to enterprise. <laughs> so uh, I use DQJS and I wanted to have Duo and Barbel just to have it compiled for me. And I used Roo, who knows Roo? Okay. Uh, Yes, nice. Uh, and it's something based on Core, which makes you build very uh, quick backend. So let me show you how the backend looks. Yes, so this is uh, Roo. Roo lets you just actually do some very common stuff. If you uh, want to have a front-end application, you want to serve some static files, you want to serve some files which you are compiling, you want to build your bundle and have maybe some middleware, and Roo just lets you register everything without much overhead. And this is actually just the function which, uh, yes, executes uh, Duo. And um, this made uh, a backend which regenerates if I change some code and made it easy to develop the front end. So, but how does the front end look? Um, I have three modules, the events, which uh, takes keyboard events. For example, if I press the Y key or the N key, then the model which actually runs the, uh, the algorithm and which keeps track of the image, I'm actually at the moment working on, and also a router. And the app bootstraps all together and um, launches the view. So how does this, for example, look? Um, this, for example, how the key things look. And this, then, how I register, register the things. And then we can um, have, for example, the board where you have where the ideas, if you have different images, you can have, a, you have them all together. And here you see it's quite React-like, um, just a bit more cleaner, I think. And um, here is now the complicated stuff, because um, I'm creating a sort of uh, um, uh, element wrapper, like you have it in React, around the canvas HTML element, and now having the model between, because on the one hand, I need to render the um, the the dots you see here over the canvas element, and I also need to get the image data over the canvas element, which can be exported quite easily, and I also need to execute this uh, segmentation process over canvas. So um, the model to show the last thing. Yes, just runs then everything and also acts a bit as a mediator between the canvas element and the geodesic distance transform. So thank you. And um, credits for these two people for writing the nice research paper. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes, maybe also not in Firefox. <laughs> Any questions? All right, no questions? None? All right. Um, OK, um, before we get into the uh, break, um, just a quick comment. The, the coupon, the discount coupon, is really worth it. So you're paying 200 euros instead of 300 euros. And that is something that we actually cross-finance 
for the community uh, because we want to have everyone on board and because the community in in Munich is is what made Munich JS and was what will make the conference. So, um, so we want everyone on board in Munich. All right, thank you. The break will be 20 minutes.
Da steh ich letzte Woche mal beim Würstelstand. Die wollte das grad bestehen, doch da hat's mich übermannt. Ich schau mir auf den Grüller, was bei ihm da alles liegt. Doch alles schaut so aus, als ob man Durchfall davon kriegt. Mir wird schon richtig schlechter Hunger, ist dein Hund. Geh, leg mir heute halt was her, weil ich brauch irgendwas im Mund. Ob Käse, Kräner, Debreziner, alles ist ein Schatz. Am liebsten hab ich mein geliebten Leberkass. Ja, 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 voll Gas, Leberkass. Ja, ja, ja. All right, uh, let's get ready for the next talk, please. Let's get ready. Du bist der Christian, oder? Genau. Sehr gut. Christian. Hi. Er war schon beim Milk Jazz. Ah, super. Oder warst du nicht da? Er macht sehr gute äh, Vorträge. 20 Minuten? Oh, ja. so. Ich gebe dir dann so, soll ich dir drei Minuten davor so Zeit geben mit Handzeichen 3? Ist es wirklich wichtig, die 20 Minuten? Sollte so Pi mal da ja, klappen. Klar. 22 geht auch, aber ja, 35 nee, ist schwierig. Ja, ja, ich stopp mit und wenn es exzessiv wird, dann kriegst du. Sehr gut, dann kriegst du. Passt. Alright, everybody. The next talk is about the anatomy of a large angular application by Christian. Hello. Hey, everyone. Um, I sure am happy you're not hangry anymore. So that's good. Hi, I'm Christian, and I'm going to be talking about that over there. It's actually based on a blog post I wrote about um, our experiences as a team uh, that we had by building a large Angular application. The application is, gets around 10 million uh, views per month. And um, this talk isn't going to be very technical. It's more like, um, like an overview of some good practices, how to structure your application so that you don't uh, go crazy while developing it. Right, um, let's start with hitting a wall. We had some issues. Uh, building a large Angular application mostly means you're going to have a big team. And with a team between 10 and 20 people, you can't expect that everyone is really good at JavaScript and uh, the usual plethora of questions always pops up like, um, where does this piece of code go? Why do all of my unit tests always break? And stuff like that. And of course, um, there is a high enough chance that you're going to write messy code or something I like to call spaghetti everything. But we'll come to that later. So we've been thinking about how could we solve it? Um, and to solve it, first we must see where our pain points are. So our pain points, the biggest pain point we had was our unit tests, because it was really like you changed something and half of your unit tests were dead, really dead. So that was a pretty, pretty bad thing. Also, uh, 
when you're using events, when you're not knowing what's actually going on, when the debugging is, is just hard, it just doesn't make fun. It, it just isn't fun. So we've come up with the following, um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So it's a three-part talk, and um, the first thing that we wanted to do was to separate our concerns to be able to have parts of the applications that aren't so dependent upon the others. With a good structure, it's good to have a cool data flow so you know what's going on, so you know where the data is flowing, what's actually going on in the application. And of course, um, yeah, developers are lazy. And uh, you, good, you need good tools to help you not do all the menial tasks. So let's start with the first thing. Uh, most probably, everyone here knows at least something about separation of concerns. It's not a new idea. But the uh, idea, to reiterate, is like this here image. You can see that's a, that's a beautiful crossing. And imagine if all people were living on a field. You wouldn't be very happy because you wouldn't have any personal space and you would be just angry all the time. So what did people do? they started separating themselves. They did a vertical separation with these buildings, and in each building, they separated themselves horizontally in floors and apartments. And that's, that's actually just what we wanted to achieve in our, uh, with our code so that each part of our application has its, has its own living space. Um, you know it, I know it, each application is more or less, I won't say the same, but similar. You have stuff like a product list, then details of a product, then some user settings, so just pages in your application. And the first thing that is good to do is to separate it vertically. What it means is just um, making parts of your application independent of each other. The cool thing is you can do this in many ways and I'm not going to be talking much about it because you can do it server side and then um, to request use sessions or, or query param parameters or whatever. Or you can do it with Angular modules. So um, you can do it in many, many ways. The only um, important thing is I don't like uh, those big single page applications where you after a while have 1,000 components and you have no idea what's going on. So um, vertical separation, thumb ups, thumbs up from me. But the really interesting thing is horizontal separation. The idea is, and you do this in Angular or whatever framework, it's going to probably support it. The idea is that you separate your concerns into, into layers. Uh, the most bottom layer are your components, Angular directives, or whatever. That's the front-facing part of your applications. Then you have some middle layer where it's just like an API or a facade, something like that, um, that's going to allow your components to actually get the data or state in which you are, right? Uh, the best thing about it is when you look at it, you don't have to know about every part of your application in every other part of your application. It's only important that you know about stuff that's been given to you. The stuff that's being given around doesn't have to know anything. It does its own thing. And in that way, you can build many, many, many parts of applications that can be very easily unit tested and that can be easily um, modified without major breakage. So the biggest wins we got here were that the project structure was much, much, much easier. Data and state in some, let's say, repositories or something like that is there. Our components talk to an API to that data, get some state, easy peasy. Uh, less of spaghetti everything. Well, spaghetti code, everyone knows what it is. It's, it's horrible. But there are some more things that you can spaghetti up and like, um, broadcasting, emitting events everywhere, scope souping stuff, and things that are just, just terrible. 
So, less spaghetti. Um, easy replacement of parts means um, if you're injecting something, it's quite easy for to inject something other in production. And because those parts are completely independent, just swap it. If it has the same API, it's going to work. Uh, about the easy unit testing, I'll come back to that in the third part. And um, now, let's say we have a nice structure. The application is cool, looks good. Our apartment, our building is looking awesomely awesome. And um, then comes the problem of the plumbing. Now, imagine you were in your apartment, you turn your tap of water in your kitchen, and water comes out, goes into the sewers, everything works cool. So the water comes into the apartment, goes out. Nice data flow, uh, flow of water. <laughs> Now you turn your water in the kitchen and the water in the bath comes on. Or worse, somehow the sewage comes up. That wouldn't be good. So um, just like you need a good plumbing in your apartment, it's good that you have a nice data flow. Uh, this isn't a new idea. React guys know it. They use flux. Um, it isn't that uh, what we came to isn't really flux, but it's it's quite similar. So let's start with the yeah hmm. spaghetti everything. So you got a component, component. You got thousands of components. Everyone is talking with everyone. They're emitting events. They're listening for events. Uh, what's going on now? Who's clicked what? Uh, debugging is a hellhole. So um, no. Let's use what we introduced in the first part of the talk, but let's focus on the component a little bit with a little bit more detail. So what's the idea? The idea is, in any way, this here template wants to show something to our user, right? Should it take the data and state directly and change something, display something? Of course not. The template should talk to the controller who should then talk to the services? Who knows what to do? So if you want to read data, the data is going to come out of the data part, but it's going to come in a known way that's easy to debug and that you always know what you're doing. Setting a breakpoint at the right location is uh, trivial, really trivial. The best part about it is uh, we have complete um, application part independency, so everything works and everything works independently. And a major win here is if you have this data state, services, and you have 50 components. All those 50 components are going to take the data from one place to the same route. That means that when the data changes, a scope digest, oh no! A scope digest is going to update the data in all of the 50 components without batting an eye. It's automatic and it's given for free. So that's cool. Now the question is how do I write data? Should I access my data in state from the template? Of course not. It's, it's the same. You have an event in your template, a click or something. That click says to the controller, hey, do something, which in turn talks to their services, which in turn know where data is located. Is it local storage? Is it MongoDB? It's completely irrelevant. And with all that said, if you look at it, it's just a circular flow of data where you first read out your data, you modify something, and with a, with a digest cycle, everything is going to get updated. So very easy. The biggest wins here are that you know which event did what because each event will, in the end, go through the same services and then it's very easy to debug. And please, for the love of God, keep your data in one place unless, okay, it's part of a component, but mostly the main model should be at one place and they know it's being changed. So with a nice apartment, a nice building, nice plumbing, someone had to build it. Yeah? 
that someone probably had good tools, right? Um, it's probably a little hmm, unthankful to talk about tools because um, every developer has its, own, has its own religion about what he's using, is it Vim, is it whatever. I'll just talk what we did and you can take away whatever you want from it. We took, we're going with TypeScript and with IntelliJ. Uh, TypeScript, because of Angular True, to be frank, um, it's clear uh, we're, we're pretty accustomed to it now. We're blown away by how good it uh, integrates with IntelliJ. The type safety is awesome. Uh, ECMAScript features, of course, it just works. But in the end, all of the tools are really great. Uh, the community has really great tools. They can really use whatever you want as long as it gets the job done, as long as it makes your life easier, use anything. The important thing is um, have a good build process in place. Uh, a basis of a good build process is really easy. Take some language that you use. Is it TypeScript, be it ECMAScript, Dart, whatever, trans slash compile slash whatever it, uh, package it, test it, deploy it, just have something that's done automatically for you. Um, with a good build process, you get cool stuff like you put watchers on your files. It's going to get compiled every time you change something. It's um, dead again, right? Ah, cool. um, you can also do live reload. That's one of the major selling points of React, right? Uh, because hitting that refresh button is hard work. So, um, and one really, really important thing, please, please, please test. So tests have saved our butts lots of times. And um, if someone says testing is hard, I'd say that he's A, having problems with the architecture of his application, or he's um, just testing too much, he's not mocking away enough, or the combination. Uh, in our case, it was a combination of things. We just weren't, um, we just weren't mocking stuff enough, and it just didn't flow good. So, if you go back to our, to our architecture, it's um, data and state. Those are some repositories, some services like that. That's easy peasy. You just test it. These services, they get the data and state injected, mock it away. Very easy. The controllers of a component are also functions, classes, types in TypeScript, whatever. Mock away those service, uh, mock away those services. Give yourself whatever return you need to unit test, and it works. The only tricky part are the components in templates, and we have a very, very good reason why we're also testing that. Angular is notorious with its um, silent failure in templates. So if you have a typo while trying to display something, you're as out of luck. It isn't going to show anywhere and uh, you just don't know what happened. So we're also testing our templates if they really have what we expect them to have and if they display it. The problem is with the controllers because the controllers get instantiated at the time when the component gets instantiated. A uh, little trick that's uh, also pretty easy to do, you instantiate, first you instantiate your component in a separate Angular module so you fire up a temporary Angular module so that all your other components, like child components, don't even fire up. And you use the compile provider to uh, mock away the controller and bind it to the component. Again, you've mocked away the thing, and it's very, very easy to test. What did we win? Uh, comfortable development. Of course, I mean, no one likes to do those menial tasks every day every hour, every minute. So when you're doing something for the hundredth time, try writing something for it. Uh, code quality mostly suffers when you're doing everything manually. It's, 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 it's just bad. And um, a good IDE plus, let's say, TypeScript, or uh, 
how's it called for this Facebook thing for type safety? We? Flow. Flow. Great. Thank you. Um, whatever, it's going to improve your code quality because it's going to show errors that you didn't even see, right? So with all that said, we're more or less at the end of the talk. If you build nice buildings with nice apartments and you build many of them and you build them and you build them just beautiful, you're going to have a beautiful large Angular application, right? Um, as I said, this talk, well, this talk uh, is based on the blog post. You can get it here. I'm going to upload this if you want to read it well, because there's much, much more detail. There's a demo application. You can play with it. And there's also a GitHub repository for the demo application to see what was actually done. And at this point, I'd really like to give a shout out to the company I work for because um, I find it I find it just cool. We're using right now Angular 1.5 in our project. We're upgrading it to Angular 2, of course. We're um, using React when it's when it's necessary. There's also um, this little monkey was drawn by a colleague of mine who likes uh, uh, user experience and likes to draw. So um, it's just cool. And if you'd like to come on board, right? Um, thank you very much for your time and um, if you have any questions. All right, any questions on Angular or on uh, organizing large scale apps? Uh, uh, you want to see the? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to upload the PDFs on the user groups, huh? so you'll, you'll get all the links. It's not a problem. I just wanted to say thank you, <laughs> because I had exactly the same problems well with React, but anyway, structuring large applications is hard. So thank you, and well, it happens that. The last Next talk is mine. Um, maybe I can give a All right. So we have one last talk. And it'll be about Falcor, which is a data delivery API by Netflix. So that's a very important and very exciting topic. Yep, so I'm ready. So well. I will start with a question. Who of you have heard about Falcor before? Raise your hands. Uh, please be quiet, everyone, OK? So if you want to talk uh, outside is OK. Um, otherwise, please be quiet. Well, OK, so let's start again. Hello, everyone. My name is Mikowai. Mikowai. I work at Lovely Books. And I will show you what Falcor is and how we use it in lovely books. So my plan is, well, shortly, first some short introduction about data and APIs in general. Then about Falcor, this will be the main part. And then as a bonus, one slide about how to integrate it with React. And also kind of a bit like how to structure a large scale application because it's pretty much the same as the previous one. <laughs> so first, introduction. Uh, so when you model the data, it's usually, it seems pretty simple, usually. <laughs> and there are some easy uh, dependencies between your data entities. So I took this example from GitHub. This is how the GitHub API looks like. So well, uh, there are, this is some small part from the GitHub API. And in fact, when, you th when it looks like this, you, sh you would think that, well, it, it can be structured easily. That, well, the user has repositories, repositories have issues. And so that it's all like one big tree. And uh, we can just get, well, we could convert all this data to just one big JSON and uh, have, the, have the API like this, or maybe ask for some repo and just have all the issues. But the problem is that the data is, in fact, not really a tree. 
and it gets more and more complicated with many more difference uh, with many more dependencies so well i just noted some that came to my mind and i found it i mean the api documentation but i'm sure that there are many many more and the data structure as such is usually not a tree it's a graph so it means that json is usually not enough because json is a tree and our data is a graph so we kind of need to transfer this and um, there are kind of two two ends of the spectrum when you try to when you develop APIs. So you could either go to towards r clean REST APIs, which have small endpoints, and where each endpoint returns a small piece of data, and you have a lot of those endpoints. Or you can have RPC, kind of RPC means remote procedure call. Uh, so you could have RPC endpoints where they are big, complex, you can query them with lots of parameters and they can give you anything you want and possibly quite large amounts of data. So those are kind of like two ends of the spectrum from what my experience is that usually people start with some clean REST API and then over time it, tur it turns into some big complex RPC monster. Um, but anyway, so REST APIs are simple, generally clean. RPC APIs are often complex. REST APIs have four strand trips, which means um, when I ask for some piece of data, usually I don't get the related data. And if I do, then I get just some amount of this related data, and then I uh, get the answer back, and then I have to send one more request to get uh, some other piece of data back. And this seems well, unavoidable in large applications. So that, well, example that I had just today, that when in lovely books, when we show a mobile book page, uh, we want to show other books by the same author. So I query the book, then I get an answer. Then I query for the author of this book, then I get an answer. And then I query for all books by the same author, and then I get an answer. And then I f can display the first cover of this book. And when, when I do it over the internet, it's slow. And RPC seems to have more flexibility and better performance in this aspect. So in REST, in REST it's also usually easy to control what data is fetched because I just send more or less requests. And those requests are small. RPC, on the other hand, seems to solve it by in another way in, endpoint, in some flexibility of endpoints. But in fact, well, there, there are some disadvantages of in either of those approaches, and we want actually both. <laughs> we, want the, our, we want both to access our data in a granular way, and we want good performance. So Falcor, Falcor tries to combine those two. So now I continue to the Falcor part. So, well, Falcor is something that kind of goes in so well this is kind of your exa your exi existing structure so you have some front end you have some back end you, and this is connected well when you look when your users look at the front end they think that the f they think that it's in the cloud so, so well in fact it's in your server and on your server you have several services and then you might possibly connect them into, in some kind of REST API and then your front end or mobile app or anything could query this REST API. And but as I said, well, REST or any other APIs are usually suffer of, from one of those two problems. And Falcor is a proxy that uh, fits in the middle and try to solve those problems so that you can still have small maintainable clean endpoints and at the same time maintain a good performance because all those run trips they don't they don't happen there in the, in the cloud let's say <laughs> they happen on your own server so those run trips can be very very fast and then your front end needs to send just one request to falcor and then falcor makes a lot of those small local requests to your REST API and then sends back a big response to you so that your page has, or your page or your mobile app or anything can have anything you want, anything you need from all your backend services in just one JSON. So that's how it solves the, the problem of round trips and of poor performance and also well, of maintainability. 
So the ideas are, well, so this seems like a big idea <laughs> to imagine that we have all the cloud on our device, but in fact, this is what we try to tell our clients, kind of. Well, think about Google Docs. So you open Google Docs, and it looks like you have a folder, and you have some files in there, and you have a feeling that it actually all happens on your computer, but it's somewhere, well, away there in the cloud. And the idea, uh, idea behind Falcor is, well, let's imagine that we actually have it on our device, so let's just not try to tell the story to our user, but let's also write our code in this way. So let's not work with network requests to our API, and well, let's, let's not worry about round trips anymore. Let's just talk about objects and their data, just like an ORM, providing an access to the database. And let's also try to unify all our data sources so that we don't care anymore about if the data is coming from the database or from Elasticsearch or maybe from some recommendations engine based on a Hadoop cluster or whatever. It's, it's just in one place so that when we fetch a book, then we can have a rating in one place uh, and, well, some search suggestions and anything. We can have it in one place, in one data entity. And we can also have functions to change this data in one place. And also, when building APIs, there is also usually a problem with caching so that when you, when you build a REST API, you usually see the promise that, well, if you have a, some small endpoints that are easy to control, then also HTTP caching will work great because whenever you ask for that user again, it would not actually make the request because uh, the, it, will, it will come from the browser cache, so it will not make the actual request. But in practice, the HTTP cache is pretty hard to control. And when you need to invalidate data, then you have to work around those mechanisms and add some query parameters, well, artificial, in fact, query parameters. And you, you, you have to maintain it. And you, you cannot access the cache directly. So you never know what's in the cache and what's not. And so it seems that it's better to have a clear and controllable caching mechanism. And that it's, that it, in that it's handled by library. So in this case, it's Falcor who, that controls the cache as well. So I'm going to show some piece of code. So, well, the, the thing on the top is just a fill, list of fields, so it's not interesting. The interesting thing is falcormodel.get. So, the, uh, well, we, of course, we need to initialize the Falcor model and, and tell it to use some HTTP data source, but then the usage of Falcor looks pretty much like this, so that uh, to display a, a book page for our case, for our new mobile frontend, we I ask for all the uh, data for works. So I ask for the main work fields, which are here, and I ask for short quotes within some range, and for some some fields from the short quotes, and some fields from the user who wrote the short quotes, and, they, and then I ask for reviews, and for each review some data, and for each review I want the first entry, and well, I want full text of it, and the user who wrote it, and I want to know the gender, and I want to have some suggestions from the gender, and I want to, yeah, I want more books from the same author, and so on and so forth. And th th so this is the this is the big request that I sent to Falcor, and then in the back end, Falcor resolves uh, those references. So in fact, well, uh, when I ask for works work ID review, it the review is in fact not there. The review is kind of in another castle. So it, it's a reference. And then it, there is another path and another endpoint to get it from there. Just Falco resolves to those dependencies in the backend. So when I see what, so well, you see the console log on the bottom. So this is what comes out from this console log. So this is just a data object, just well like ordinary JavaScript object. And everything that I asked for is he already here. So like reviews, reviews are already here. So with the first entry and all the data that I asked for, just like normal JavaScript object. But the, it's interesting, well, how, how does this magic happen? So let's look in the network tab. In, it, in the network tab, you see that there's well, a big request <laughs> made the Falker backend that just lists all those needed data 
um, data points. So here it's, well, URL escape, so it's, it looks ugly, but you get the idea. And then we'll, when we look at the response, it looks similar, but, uh, well, take a look at this. We ask just for works with, well, some ID and for some fields for it. And well, kind of everything was in that work, but the JSON that we got from the server has a different structure. It says JSON graph on top, and then it, con it says, and then we have well, kind of other kinds of entities. So authors, by name, entries, genres, topics, users, works. So what happened is that uh, what we get in this JSON from the server is the internal JSON graph st structure, so that we see that, well, this is the work. Work for us means book. <laughs> um, so we ask for this work, and here we see that the genre, for example, is a reference. So this thing is a reference, and it points to genres and Romane in there. So then we would go to genres and to Romane, and here's our data. And Falcor, the Falcor client puts it all together, so that we can see this as, well, just one big JavaScript object, and then we can easily pass it to our React components or, or Angular components or, well, whatever other components you might have. And also um, notice that there is just one request to the model, so that I make just one request to the API for the whole, uh, for the whole page. And I will go into, a, well, a bit of detail into how this JSON graph works. Um, so JSON graph, so as you know, as you have seen, it's kind of like JSON, but it has references. And references look like, the, look like this. So there's a value which tells Falcor where to go and where to get this piece of data. And there are atoms. And atoms can be, well, any primitive values from JavaScript that, well, just like you're used to. Uh, you can also wrap those values explicitly in an atom. And so this might not seem very reasonable, but you c using this notation, you can add more information. And this is a great way to control, for example, those caching mechanisms or to return some metadata together with the data. And so, for example, we can say that this data is, well, is some value, but it will expire. And if the user needs this data later, then please send a request for it again. So this is, this is well, hard to achieve with normal REST APIs. And also using Atom, when we wrap it, we can return any arrays of objects as one thing. So that for Falcor, it is like a primitive. So it always returns it as, a whole, as one whole. Um, the, um, because when you have objects, you, you always query them by fields. So you never, f well, unless you pack it as an atom, you never fetch object as one big thing. Just you, you fetch some specific fields of the object and never the, the object as, as a whole. And also very useful thing, the third type of stuff in the JSON graph is error. And this is important because in REST API, well, the, a request can succeed, a request can fail. And here, when we send just one big request to the API, we don't want this request to fail, whatever happens. And it, it can happen that some pieces, uh, that just fetching some pieces of data failed because the database is overloaded or some, well, some other endpoint is down or there is some bug or anything. So we don't want the, well, the whole page to fail. We just want some part of the page to fail. So that's why when there is some error in the road handler, Falco returns an error like this and doesn't fail the entire request. So that's it about Falco for now. Uh, I have just one slide about the React integration. So React integration is easy when you have a good component structure. So this pretty much aligns up with the previous talk by Christian. Uh, and well, so you have some components 
you have some components composed of other components, and the key to make them well easily maintainable and easy bindable with Falcor is to give them stateless. And then, uh, well, so Fal the Falcor library gives us a Falcor server and the Falcor client, and to connect them. I, well, I personally think <laughs> that the best idea is to have some container component that would load the data so that not every component talks with the Falcor client. So, well, it's entirely possible, but from my own experience with Falcor, it seems that the best way is to have the, this logic separated in some container component and so that this component uh, only loads the data and it manages the data is it acts as a controller and it doesn't have any styles it just in the in uh, instantiates some other component and those components in the bottom they have styles they look nice and so on so and in fact well i think i did it with react i think it's nice with react but in fact you can use this structure and and connect it to any other framework that you use and it, it should just work because falcor is pretty much framework agnostic when it comes to the view it's just for data fetching data sending and managing this data and managing changes in the data so that you always know that you have one copy of the data that the data is always consistent and whenever you change anything you ch you have it changed in kind of in all the places. So it's, in fact, it's one place, but you can see it in many places on the page. So this makes it much easier to manage all this data together in a web application. So that's it, that's my, well, almost last slide, because I have two more. I'm, so I'm kind of finished about Falcor. I, I prepared the slide for you with, well, some further reading if you want to know more about Falcor. Those slides are available on the internet, and then when you open them on your laptop or anything, you can click those links, actually. So I, I'll give you some time to photograph this slide. And I have one, one more announcement. So as you know, I work in Lovely Books, and we hire just developers. So we, we, need some, we need some experience in JavaScript. So I think all of you have experience in JavaScript. And then you will be able to learn our, well, JS text. So we use Falcor. We have a very nice style guide for the front and we use React. And you will work in the friendly team and you, get, you will get free books each month. <laughs> All right, any questions? A URL limit for Falcor? You show that uh, all requests are over the get address. Yeah, so. Yeah, so well, th there was a question about the limit of URLs or the limit of paths that could be requested on uh, on a on a Falcor uh, in a Falcor endpoint. So the answer is no. There is no limit. I mean, there is there is a, obviously when you want to request it using GET, then there is a limit of the URL size. Yes, but well, in fact, I, I guess that you can uh, you can make a request using POST or anything else. I mean, I mean. I don't think that th this is a problem. There is another problem that your backend might fail if you actually, if you request a lot of routes. But then uh, I think that <laughs> this is another question. And I actually am not sure that there is a good solution for it. And I hope that there will be some in the future. <laughs> All right, one more question. Um, because afterwards you have, uh, we're gonna s stick around and you can just walk up to the speaker and, and ask him. Uh, one more question. Yeah, great talk. Um, in one slide, you showed that you have some kind of error handling with a message, something went wrong, and so on. Can you actually uh, split because you have multiple requests? 
combined or aggregated in one. So you are actually handle this as a transaction. So if one of these requests didn't work, you show this message, or you can handle each of these separately. Yeah, so whenever an error happens, then Falker just marks anything that could be returned by this route as failed. So for example, if it is a reference to something else, then well, anything that could be referenced by this thing is marked as failed. So maybe that's an answer. Um, maybe this also needs some clarification about how Falcor works on the server side. So uh, Falcor, just like a REST API, uh, Falcor has a router. Just the difference is that in REST API, a road handler can handle just one specific road, and Falcor and Falcor handlers can handle a set of roads. So you s you've seen that in my request, I make a request for a lot of roads, and in fact, many of those roads can be handled by just one handler. And so you can structure those handlers depending on how your backend is structured and how your what services does it come from. So you have some flexibility in this manner. And then also Falcor knows which road handler is supposed to return which piece of data. So when this handler throws some exception, then Falcor just marks this those paths as failed with this specific error. So All right, uh, thank you for attending, everyone. Uh, it's fun, don't go away, stay. Uh, there's gonna be more stuff to drink and we'll play a little music uh, and we can stay a little longer here and socialize. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So. Is the music ready?
Thank you.